this morning. Our lesson comes from Acts 9 through 119 and continues the lessons learned at Pentecost. Hear these words of power, faithfulness, and change from God's holy word. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for lessons to the synagogue, for, asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard the voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you prosecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Taurus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing on his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. The Word of God for the people of God. Will you please pray with me? <clears throat> Loving God, we come into your presence. We've heard your scriptures, Lord. I pray that you have prepared our hearts for the message that will be shared. I pray, Lord, that in my meditation, I heard your voice. I know, Lord, that you have a mighty plan in store for today. I pray, Lord, that that we have ears that hear your voice and we have hearts that are ready to move in your directions. Make this time fruitful, Lord, for your purpose and your glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Paul's story of meeting Jesus is one of my favorites for so many different reasons. Partly because I love to hear people's conversion stories, especially those who go on to do great and mighty things for God. I like to try to figure out what causes them to sacrifice so much with so much joy. But partly because in so many ways I can relate to Paul. Hopefully not the first part, because when we first are introduced to Paul, in, uh, he was known as Saul at that point in chapter 8, and we forget about this, this little portion sometimes. Um, it was when Stephen was being stoned to death. And at this point, he was called Saul, and, and he was standing, um, gathering people's coats as they went to stone Stephen. And he was giving approval for what was happening. He was approving the violent death of one of the leaders of the church. And in the verses that immediately follow that, um, talking about that, that story of the stoning, we read that Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. He wasn't a very gentle man. And then today's reading began with, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, 
he would take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This brings us to our first point to ponder, and one of the reasons I love Saul, who becomes Paul. It says, God calls us in the midst of our messiness, our brokenness. We don't have to fix ourselves to be useful for God. Saul wasn't a very good man. He wasn't doing kind and loving things. He wasn't a pacifist, a scholar, or a philanthropist. Paul had evil intent in his heart and was committed to completing his goals. But to give Saul credit, uh, that's due him, his goals were based on what he thought was right, what he thought God wanted. He just didn't quite have it right. He was a bit of a mess at this point. So here's what gives me hope. God knew that Saul was a mess. God saw his weakness, but called him to a specific task anyway. What's ironic is that God used that same intensity that Paul had for killing Christians to reach out an invitation, acceptance, and affirmation to build up the very community that he had been trying to destroy. God meets us where we are and offers us the choice to change course. Saul had been cruising along, doing his own thing, and getting great results. But God had another plan for Saul. Because as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. And I heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? asked Saul. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what to do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Jesus was dramatic in this instance, but he didn't force Saul to do anything. Nor did Jesus give Saul an idea of what was about to happen. Saul had the joy choice of obeying the directive of a man he feared and whose disciples he had been persecuting or fleeing in another direction altogether. Can you imagine what it was like to be told by Jesus when you're blind and completely vulnerable to go into that city where they knew you were coming to try to kill them and destroy them? But this is what I love about Paul. I absolutely love it. Because he never did anything halfway. He had been going on this course full tilt, full steam. But he heard the voice of Jesus calling him into a new direction. And he got up and he allowed his men to lead him blind into the unknown. I thought about using a video at this point showing a sailboat changing course. So I went online and I started looking at, at some videos. And I'm telling you, that process is intense. I knew they were all going to make it fine, but as they're making that swing around, I would, my heart would start to race. And there was this one video that I watched. It was a training video. And uh, in that one, the, the person who was talking about it explained that the key to changing course is preparation and communication. God begins with communication with Saul and communication and preparation with Ananias. We hear in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Can you imagine Ananias' thoughts and emotions at this point? God is now asking Ananias to risk his life and the life of the church in Damascus. God invites Ananias to change course. And it's pretty intense. 
Ananias' faithful change allowed God to work through him to prepare Saul for the major changes he was going to make. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. Which brings us to point to ponder number two. God prepares us for the mission God has for us. And God doesn't promise that the mission will be without pain and struggle. We've been using Paul, Saul's story to explore how God works in our lives and how we can faithfully respond to God. This passage also reminds us of the intensity of a faithful life with Christ. Each of us is moving in a, along in a certain direction, and like this picture, we have some wind in our sails. Some may have more wind than others and, and be moving at a faster speed. The question is whether or not we're moving in the direction that God has for us. Remember, Saul believed he was moving in the right direction and that God would be pleased with his accomplishments. But God had other plans. It wasn't until Saul changed course and committed to listening and following God that he became Paul. The man chosen to make it possible for you and me and all other non-Jews to become Christians. In the same way, many of us are moving in a direction that seems right to us. And we may be getting wonderful results. But we have to stop and ask God and listen for God's voice. To see if that's the direction that God wants to work in us and through us. So that God's needs can be accomplished. And I think that most of us believe that God is going to make sense. God isn't going to ask us to move in a direction that seems impossible or at a speed that's uncomfortable. But one of the lessons that I, I learned from the scripture is that God asks us to go to the strangest places and into some very uncomfortable and dangerous situations. I often hear people say that they don't think they're supposed to serve in a certain area because they're not comfortable or things aren't going well. They suggest that if God wanted them to be in that place doing that thing, then all the details would just fall into place and it would be smooth sailing. But if we look at Paul's example, then we hear God say, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. In this picture, the very wind that's moving the sailboat beautifully across the water is also causing the waves in the water. In 1994, I took my first group into Mexico to build houses. And that first year was, was crazy. We worked with the Wesley Foundation and, and took a group of their kids. And we took some around 10 college students. There were about 24 to 30 high school students, 10 to 15 adults, and my eight-year-old son. Um, we went into Nuevo Progreso, and our goal had been to build four houses. That first day was absolute chaos. They wouldn't let our, our big trucks that had all of our supplies and wood come across the border. I'm pretty sure it was the first day that I hit the, um, the, the little drop-down bar at the border, and they don't like it when you do that. Um, it might have been the second day, but it was one of them. I was a little nervous going across the first time. Um, but we met the people in the community. We ate lunch with them, and we visited the town, and we waited, and we waited, and our lumber never showed up. So we ended up going back across that evening without ever starting work. The next day we wake up and this time we got smart and we took cards with us. And we took decks of cards across the border and sure enough the truck didn't get across at the beginning of that day. So we taught the, the families that we were supposed to be building homes for uh, several card games and played all day long, which was, it was a wonderful experience. But when we went back across the border that night, we had to decide if we were going to wait another day or pack up and go home. Turns out the local government wasn't happy. They weren't happy that we were bringing in our own lumber. They wanted us to buy our supplies on the Mexico side. So they were, they were just not allowing us to bring it across. 
we began to wonder if maybe God didn't want us in Mexico building houses because the details weren't falling into place. That evening, our worship service changed totally. Instead of um, using the scripture and singing the songs and listening to the message that we had planned, instead, we sang songs and we prayed. And we listened for God's voice and then had a conversation about what we heard. And it went back and forth. That was probably one of the longest worship services we had. In the end, we decided to stay the course. The next day, uh, partway through the day, we were able to get the lumber for two of the houses across the border. So we had 40 to 45 people building two houses. Uh, it got a little, a little crowded and a little tense. But we were able to, to build two house, both houses in two days, uh, which was pretty amazing. This past spring break, that same church took their 20th trip to the valley. And in that time, they built somewhere around 150 homes, a two-story school, additions to five churches, and then have rehabbed I don't even know how many houses down in the valley. Had that church turned around and decided that the trouble, there was too much trouble and obviously God wasn't leading them, I don't know that they would have gone back. God never said accomplishing God's work would be a smooth and painless experience. Wendy Gens, Amy Heisel, and the VBS volunteers could probably tell you the same thing about this time. And the Sea City Board that's also been in place for about 20 years probably has many, many stories of their own of wrinkles and struggles to make things happen. Following God and allowing God to direct our lives isn't easy. But when we turn ourselves to catch God's winds, then we begin the beautiful, scary, incredible journey. And each and every one of us has been invited on this journey. God is asking you to turn your sails. I know there are many people in here that, that might not think that they're the right person or that they're not the right type of person to be in ministry for God. God uses us, our true nature, to accomplish God's plan. God doesn't change who we are to fit a perfect mold. And I give God thanks for that every day because there will never be a time when I feel like I fit the perfect mold. Paul was always intense, aggressive, and committed. And God didn't change that. Paul didn't become a clone of Jesus or even any of the disciples. God created each and every one of us for a purpose. And who we are fits God's plan for us. We aren't asked to be clones of Paul simply to fully live who God created us to be, but be pointed in the direction that God desires. We need to remember Ananias in this story as well. God called him to step outside of his comfort zone and to take a risk. Sometimes we're called to do great, big, exciting things, to start new ministries or, or to be the head of a committee. But other times we're called to empower others in ministry. In each case, God used the gifts and the strengths of the individual. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and after taking some, he got up and was baptized, number one, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. We don't hear anything else about Ananias of Damascus. He was well respected by the Jews in the city, so I assume that he continued to do anything that God asked of him. After Paul receives his sight and is filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes on to develop and support churches throughout the Mediterranean and, and some of Europe and a great portion and, and wrote a great portion of the New, New Testament. Each man was invited to change his course to step out of his comfort zone. Now, we could go back to assuming that they rode off into the sunset 
and everything was peaceful and easy. Paul began churches in many major cities and experienced miraculous events that saved the lives, the souls of many people. In the midst of chaos, Paul glorified God and served with passion and with truth. But I think this picture better describes the rest of Paul's journey. My hope is that my service to God, can I just say that's my nephew right in the middle. <laughs> uh, my hope is to say that my service to God requires a life jacket and ends with me barely crawling to shore, but with the biggest grin on my face. Our challenge is to turn our sails to meet the Holy Spirit, to joyfully turn our lives and our service in the direction God desires, to fearlessly run the race and to live every moment as a person God designed us to be. Let's pray. Loving God, I give thanks that you have so much in store for each and every one of us. I give thanks, Lord, that you created us to be who we are, unique and amazing. Lord, we read that we are fearlessly and wonderfully made. And I know, Lord, that when you look at each and every one of us, you see who you created us to be. I pray, Lord, that you help give each and every one of us a glimpse of that vision. That you allow us to hear clearly when you call us to move in a new direction. I pray, Lord, that you give us the strength to fully live out this life of, of service, of love, of passion for your people. Lord, we know that, that what you have in store may not be easy, but that it brings peace and joy and passion. Help us to hear your voice and help us to turn ourselves and experience all of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.